Hello. Welcome, everybody. My name is Emma Harper, and I'm very happy to be here with all of you in celebration of California Native people. So I want to talk a little bit about myself as a Native woman. I grew up in Siskiyou County with Karuk, otherwise known as Upper River, up, up River people, uh, Native values, along with my four sisters and my one brother and many, many, many other Indian kids, aunties, Grammys, and family. I belong to the Karuk ancestral territories that was inhabited by not only the Karuk tribe, but also the Klamath and Shasta and Winnemumwintu Indians in Siskiyou County. These tribes have been stewards of the land and river for hundreds of years before the pioneers and the settlers came and they pass their values on to their children still today. I want to acknowledge Happy Camp, Klamath Falls, Quartz Valley, and Humboldt County lands. I belong to this land and it rings deep inside me. I belong to it and it belongs to me. To me, being native means waking up early with my family before the sun came up to get ready to go buck hunting, skinning deer, eating brains and eggs, cutting backstrap from the warm deer that our dad had just killed to make salt and cayenne jerky to munch on, eating poofitch deer meat and fried eels and dried smoked salmon, picking ichnish and eating the black licorice tasting plant as I swam in the river, diving deep beneath the current for salmon and scaring them out of the rocks as they hid for our dads and our brothers to spear and throw them on the riverbank so we can smoke and eat them for the rest of the year. We caught the eels at night with socks on our hands so they would not slip away as our eyes adjusted to the dark. We could see them and we could grab them out of the dam. Excuse me dozens of them <laughs> wiggling in the fresh water, waiting to be eaten up by us kids. Swimming in the deep, dark, emerald green fresh waters rivers where the water was feel, filled with fresh salmon, picking up the rocks to find hulger mites underneath to fish with later. I remember waiting for hours every day for a week as my dad and my unk and some of us kids visited the brown bear in her nest. I was taught to be quiet, to watch, to be still. The bear taught me that. The bear would get to know our scent. We would be part of her surroundings and she would become used to us. After that week, I saw my uncle sit and wait again. I saw him come outright, right on the bear as we had been visiting her for weeks. And then the bear gave us her bounty and we had meat and we ate and we had lard to cook with. Today, I pay my respect and I acknowledge the rivers, the deer, the honkers, the bears, the mountain lions, and the grouse that taught me. I will keep my promise to never turn my back on the Salmon River, the Etna Creek, the Big Hole, the Shackleford Falls, and the Klamath Rivers who raised me. Growing up like this drives my values in the work I do with the Democratic Party. I am native to this California land and it is always in me. I will be patient and I will be calm. And I will also be wild when the time comes, like the rivers that raised me. So before we begin, I want to introduce Nicole Lim. Um, Nicole Lim is a POMO and has worked for the National Indian Justice Center and the California Indian Museum and Cultural Center since 1996. As the executive director of the California Museum and 
Culture Center. She works to develop exhibits, educational programs, and curricular resources that represent Native American perspectives. Uh, I wanted her to explain a little bit more about Native American sovereignty. Thank you, Emma. I'm Pomo and Miwok, um, coming to you from the Tri-County region, uh, Sonoma, Mendocino, and Lake County, which is our Pomo and Miwok territory. We have 24 tribes in our region in Northern California. And um, just to review a little bit about sovereignty. Um, sovereignty can be a complex issue, especially when you're talking about tribal sovereignty. And there's a few fundamental um, definitions that you should examine when looking at sovereignty. So sovereignty is essentially your right to make laws and be governed by them. And each foreign nation has sovereign powers, external and internal sovereign powers, your powers to wage war, your powers to make treaties, your powers to collect taxes, your powers over your land and regulating that land. And the United States recognized or the European colonizers essentially recognized inherent power of tribes. Um, if they hadn't done that, they wouldn't have made treaties with them. However, when the United States government started defining sovereignty, it started diminishing that sovereignty. And there were a series of cases in the 1830s, often referred to as the Marshall Trilogy because of Chief Justice Marshall who decided them. And they started really working on the idea of what tribal sovereignty was and making it very different from inherent sovereignty. And in doing that, tribal sovereignty is essentially a legal fiction as defined by the federal government and the Supreme Court. And so in those cases, they really examined federal paternalism and started talking about tribes as guardians and the federal government or the tribes as wards and the federal government as guardians and examining the power of tribes to own land and decided that because of colonization and doctrine of discovery that essentially tribes only possessed aboriginal title which was used in occupancy and not ownership. So they moved away from that inherent sovereignty. And obviously it was for their own purposes. Um, and since then, the Supreme Court in defining sovereignty really um, looks at, you know, kind of chipping away at tribal sovereign powers, especially when it comes to criminal jurisdiction, which we don't possess criminal jurisdiction over non-Indians. When it comes to civil jurisdiction, there's a test that examines uh, whether or not a non-Indian's impact is essential or whether they're in a consensual relationship with a tribe before a tribe can exert that jurisdiction over them. So sovereignty is very much um, fragile. And when it comes to the Supreme Court, um, they're often looking to find ways to restrict our tribal sovereignty. And they often refer to it as a delegation of power from the federal government and from Congress. As tribes, we do not view it as a delegation of power. We are inherently sovereign. There are other Supreme Court cases that point to the fact that we predate the constitution and our sovereignty is not a delegation of power from the federal government. So we're continually in that struggle to fight to maintain our inherent sovereignty and to strengthen it because it's about our self-determination and our ability to define our futures, um, whether that is politically, economically, or culturally. As tribes, we maintain that integrity of our sovereignty. And so I hope that helps a little bit in trying to examine some of those complicated issues. Thank you so much. Yeah, I mean, I, I just learned a little bit right then. So I really appreciate that explanation. Um, and just understanding how important it is to teach Native American history in American studies. Um, I, I do have um, a few links in the chat if anyone else would like to learn about it. And of course, you know, 
Um, if if anybody else um, has any uh, anything else to uh, add to that, feel free to do that. But I will add this to the chat. And then um, Nicole, can you please uh, give us the can you please provide your land acknowledgement for the native territory that you are on today? Sure, I'm on my own ancestral homelands. You can see them illustrated in my Zoom background. Um, we are people from the valley, we are people from the coasts, and we are people from the lake. We have 24 tribes throughout our tri-county region. Um, it's Pomo and Miwok territory. Um, it is a beautiful area of Northern California where we are very blessed with so many beautiful resources, especially our oak savannas. And they provide so much nutrients with our acorns and our other cultural resources that we are working to revitalize. Um, land acknowledgements are really critical steps towards working towards meaningful collaboration and consultation with tribes. While we exist in our homelands, we our authority in our homelands is often usurped, and we are always fighting to work to engage our traditional ecological knowledge in our stewardship and. Um, you know, I often say to folks who invite us um, to partner that we we appreciate the opportunity to pray in our homelands, but don't just invite us to pray. Invite us to the boardrooms, invite us to make decisions, um, strengthen our authority and control so that we can make our ancestral territory better for everyone, including our, our, our future generations. Exactly, thank you for that. So we have a great panel of California Native people and dedicated longtime Democratic Party activists to introduce tonight. Um, and the, to introduce tonight and to discuss uh, what it means to be Native American Indigenous in California. So first up, we have Marianne Andreas. Give her a minute to get on screen. Hi there. Yes, here Hi, I am. And Good. so, Marianne, I'm going to talk a little bit about you, if you don't mind. I'm going to introduce you were born and raised on the reservation of the Morongo Band of Mission Indians, and you with your eight brothers and sisters. And your beginning on the reservation formed your commitment to improving life for family and tribal members. And you've gone on to become a very respected tribal, tribal and democratic party leader in both state and federal fronts in the battle to protect tribal sovereignty and Indian interests. So you currently serve as the chair of the California Democratic Party Native American Caucus. And so thank you so much for join us, joining us. This is really special to me that you are here to do this with us. Um, so I have a question. Can you also provide your land acknowledgement for the native territory that you are on today? I can. I can. My name is Marianne Andreas. I'm uh, uh, a member of the Moronga Band of Mission Indians. We're located in the Pass area. We're known as Pass Kawea and Serrano. Um, we have uh, been here for generations. Not only have I been all my life here, my parents have been all their lives here. Their grand my grandparents, my great grandparents for time and memorial. Um, thank you all and uh, good evening Democrats. I hope we have a good showing tonight. Uh, I do wanna say upfront, you are all on indigenous land. Uh, land acknowledgements are just one way to increase the visib visibility of native peoples and combat the erasure of native peoples. They help increase the visibility every, at every gathering. You know, if you can do a land acknowledgement, you're increasing the visibility of native people. All too often, the history of the United States erases the rich and long history of indigenous people that have on our land and purposely, purposefully excludes the genocide, forced removal, violence experienced by native peoples during colonization. And colonization is still ongoing. Indigenous people are still here and their lands are still occupied. So as a result of this erasure, many Americans do not even know that native peoples ex exist today. Land acknowledgements are a good first step to building more substantial relationships and partnerships with Native peoples and other communities. These acknowledgements are also an opportunity to recognize Native peoples in the present day 
Native peoples continue to protect our land and water and maintain cultural traditions and practices and contribute in immeasurable ways to society today. The process of creating a land acknowledgement is a personal and unique one, and there is no direct script. It differs for each and every one of us, which is what I told you what happened tonight. I mean, whoever signed on, they would have their own land acknowledgement. Normally when we're in person at a convention or an e-board, someone can get up and do a land acknowledgement like I've done before in general for everyone. But tonight we're doing each and every one of us, which I think is a great thing as everybody is unique in their uh, land, in their experience, in their beliefs. And, and um, that's what we fight for, our beliefs, our culture, our songs, our ceremonies. So thank you so much. Thank you, Democrats. Thank you, Marianne. And I, I agree. I thought that was a brilliant idea for each of us to give our land acknowledgement because it's important to me and I'm sure yeah. it's important to you. So, well, with, uh, I'll come back to you, Marianne, with a few other questions uh, throughout the, the program. But next, I want to introduce Jolie Proudfoot. So, Jolie, are you here? Jolie Proudfoot, excuse me. Oui. Uh, Jolie is going to be joining in just a moment. Okay. Oh, Great. here she is. <laughs> So Emma, you can start to intro her and then she will come on when you're done. Okay, great. So Dr. Jolie Proudfit is a Lusueño scholar, activist, and media maker. Dr. Proudfit serves as the director of the California Indian Culture Sovereignty Center and the department chair of American Indian Studies at Cal State San Marcos. Dr. Proudfit owns Native Media Strategies, which consults, collaborates, and produces with the entertainment industries and professionals to, de to develop the inclusive strategies in fostering authentic representation of Native Americans. Dr. Proudfit is committed to serving the American Indi Indian community and uh, in several capacities. Uh, she serves as and she also serves as the vice chair for the Native American Caucus for the CDP. So, uh, Dr. Proudfit, are you? Hi, good to see you. <laughs> Very nice to have you. And so, uh, as uh, we've all been doing tonight, can you please provide your land acknowledgement for the Native territory that you're on today? Yes. Um, Mia Young, the tongue Dr. Jolie Proudfit. I'm uh, Jolie Prophet and happy to be with you tonight. And I have the good fortune of uh, living um, and working and learning and teaching on the traditional homelands of the Payunkawicha Luceno people. I am Payunkawicha, my Luceno. So I, I'm one of those native persons that has the good fortune of being able to live and work on their homelands. Not most native people don't have that opportunity. So I, I recognize that that is a privilege. So I live here in Carlsbad, California. Um, which um, is uh, part of the Payunkawichum um, traditional homelands and today remains the shared space with the uh, um, Kumeyaay and the Payunkawichum people. And I teach at Cal State San Marcos, which is also um, Payunkawichum land. And um, our campus has very much respected and adopted Payunkawichum language and traditions around the campus community. In fact, um, Tukwit, which um, in the Luceno Payunkawichum language means mountain lion, um, is our unofficial mascot of the university. We have Tukwit Talks, which are ASI students. Um, that's the official name of the ASB. Um, we have Tukwit towels that are sold and shared at basketball games. Um, so we have really in incorporated that in Miu um, in our language means hello. So at the beginning of each fall semester, there's a Miu night for the entire campus and all new students, they come in to greet and to learn about the campus community. So I, like I said, I have the really good fortune of zooming into you from my home in Carlsbad, which is the traditional homelands of the Payunkawicha and Luceno people. Wow, thank you very much. 
really appreciate that. Okay, so um, I did already introduce Nicole, but I, I kind of wanted to introduce Nicole again, if that's okay. So just uh, Nicole, it, Nicole Lim is Pomo, and she has worked for the National Indian Justice Center and the California Indian Museum and Cultural Center since 1996, as I said. And as the director of the California Indian Museum and Culture Center, she works to develop exhibits, educational programs, and curricular resources that represent Native American, the Native American perspective. So um, with that, I'm gonna actually, Nicole, I'm gonna ask uh, a question. Uh, of you, if you're okay with that. So you founded a tribal youth ambassador program in 2010. Can you tell us a little bit about how this program was impact, has impacted Native American youth and what we can learn from the next generation of Native people? Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I founded that program for several reasons. One was my my own experience growing up in Sonoma County and being in a school where I was maybe one or two or three Native youth in that school and not really having a sense of, of support and, and community with other Native youth. And then um, as my children started going through the California education system, I started seeing the impacts that negative experiences were having uh, on them from experiences with their teachers in the classroom, with their peers on the playground. And it really results from the fact that, you know, our history, um, especially, you know, the genocide that happened from the Spanish missions, as well as the gold rush, is taught in the fourth grade. And it's not done in an honest way, it's not done authentically, and it's really done in a way that harms both Native and non-Native children. And seeing that impact on them um, and seeing the lack of support for Native youth as they felt marginalized and displaced by their educational system, because as Native youth, they know their own histories, you know, our family, there were over 300 massacres in California. Our great grandmother was a childhood survivor of Bloody Island Massacre, where they count anywhere from 10 to 800 people are in a mass grave in Clear Lake. Um, the children survived that massacre through hiding under the water and breathing through tule reeds and hiding under their parents who didn't survive. Um, our children know the truth and when they go into the classroom and do not see that represented or when they try to speak up and challenge teachers and then are told that they're not native or that they need to sit down and be quiet, um, there's tremendous negative impacts upon them. And so our Tribal Youth Ambassadors Program was really born out of supporting youth, giving them the opportunity to learn that history, giving them the tools to meet racism and historical bias where they find it and and leave those things on the field um, essentially not carry that hurt and um, disappointment around and so um, the tribal youth ambassadors was a program where they are able to actively engage in cultural learning um, to make educational resources to make films to do videos to do plays to make maps that um, track all of the schools that have native mascots or where the massacres happened. Or recently they made a map tracking where the pesticides in our county impact our basketry resources. So it's really a program that engages culture and technology and community and connectivity. And it's strength-based, you know, we know, um, the tragedy of our history. And we know the challenges that we face as Native people growing up. Um, the statistics are not in our favor. However, we have our culture and our culture is powerful and it provides us resilience and strength to know that our people survived despite all the odds and despite the colonizers' best efforts. And they saved 
all of this valuable information for us. And it's up to us to define it into the future. And it's really important that people understand that tribal cultures, uh, while academia tends to try to frame them and freeze them in time, we're dynamic, we're living, we're changing, we're shifting. And our cultures are being lived by the young people in our communities, and they'll define that future. I often heard from tribal youth tell me, I don't feel Indian enough. And I'd say, Indian enough for who? You know, the people who are judging you don't know us. Um, they don't know, all they know are stereotypes and inaccuracies. And we're constantly put in a position to educate. Um, but you're the one who defies your identity and your future based upon your cultural learning. And so our Tribal Youth Ambassadors was giving them the opportunity to engage that. Program's been around for 10 years. Um, they received an award in 2016 from Michelle Obama through the National Arts and Humanities Youth Program Awards. And um, just been very proud and grateful to be around young people and, um, and help them define their futures. Thank you. So I have a question, Marianne, for you. Um, can you give maybe one example or one thing or some, some insight to the folks here about how you learned within your tribe to exist in tandem with your surroundings? Yeah, I would say that uh, it, it had a lot to do with the uh, political identity and, and unlearning some of, the, some of the stuff we had been taught and uh, working hard through experience, through hands-on, mm. um, I'm getting a call. Um, you know, just that was how things were learned through experience, through failure. A lot of times, failure is is um, is a good, great teacher. So um, the many things that we tried and failed, we kept on trying, and actually had some success and built on that success and kept on. You know, and then tried to pass on to our younger people uh, our Native American identity. Uh, that was strong enough to for them to carry on the future. I think that's so important because uh, sometimes Native American tribes determine who's a tribal member and who's not, and and it becomes very divisive and very hurtful and very um, dispiriting to some of our young people. So we have to uh, give them a basis in on on which to build and to uh, there again give them the experience, give them the learning tools, give them uh, the ability to withstand failure. You know, I myself was uh, in a, a residential boarding school when I was six years old till I was nine years old. And it was, uh, uh, I, I can't say there were beatings or sexual abuse or any murder or what I've heard, but it was a very lonely experience. You can imagine at six years old, being away from your parents, being away from your home, being away from your siblings. Uh, three of us were, were in um, residential boarding school until we were, until my mother got well, she got sick and then she got well and then we were able to go home. But yeah, it, it's, uh, it's a tough, tough uh, way to learn, but you learn to speak up, you learn to defend yourself, you learn to take care of yourself, and you learn to fight for, uh, to protect your, your loved ones. So hold that thought because I'm going to come back to you about the Child Welfare Act in a little bit. So, okay. yeah, that's part one for Nikki. <laughs> so, oh, okay. Well, well, we'll come back to that for sure. So uh, I wanted, I did want to ask Dr. Progfit, uh, I understand that you have a book coming out next year and it's titled Beyond the American Indian Stere Stereotype. Can you tell us a little bit about why, what led you to writing this book? Yeah, so I'm so glad you asked. You could pre-order it on Amazon, right? That's not like a pitch or anything. But um, in fact, I know Nikki's going to talk about the book that we wrote together that's out that you could also get. But there's a whole chapter in why I needed to write the Beyond the American Indian Stereotype book. And unfortunately, what happened um, was, I believe it was in 2012, it um, 
some some college grads from our campus and I have to say our campus um, is remarkable in a number of ways. One, we have um, a 4% American Indian student population. That's higher than any institution of higher learning in the state of California. Most are between 0.1% to about 0.7 at the highest, right? And so we have used the model, if you build it, they will come. So we have a Native Advisory Council, we have a, a research center, we have a full-time tribal liaison, so we have all these resources. Um, yet in 2012, some anthropology grads um, had a graduation party and they put it all over social media with the hashtag Cowboys and Indians and the girls were scantily clad dressed as Indians and the boys were dressed as cowboys and they were drinking with their red solo cups and they put it all out there. Well, I'm not a social media user myself, but um, it was in you know late May and my students started calling me and they said, oh no, you have to see this over social media. So they sent me the screenshots of images and I'm like, oh my gosh. And what really unnerved me was there was a, a tribal chairperson from one of our local San Diego tribal communities. And he said, is this what a degree from Cal State San Mar Marcos gets you? So these were, these were graduates of a department nowhere near us, has nothing to do with us, but they thought that it was okay to have this kind of party. And, you know, the this over-sexualization of Native women and the costuming of Native women and the scantily clad of these women wearing these headdresses, you know, that just pushed all, our, an already narrative that already is out there that is dangerous to us. We know that missing and murdered Indigenous women is a problem in this country and in Canada. And we know the over-sexualized of these images is a problem. So, you know, I immediately wrote an email as the director of the California Indian Culture and Sovereignty Center. I mean, it's in the title. I have to say something. And I, I start to write this email. My husband looks over my shoulder. He's like, you cannot possibly send that, right? You're going to get in trouble because I, I, I was so angry. So we toned it down. And what I ended up writing was the statement that, that basically encouraged these women to come back to school to come and talk to our Native Student Club, to come and take a class and to, to hear about why this is not okay. And, um, and then I quoted my mentor um, talking about waging the war, the intellectual war in our minds, right? That's, that's like the only weapons that we have is knowledge, knowledge is power. And so I wrote that and I posted that on our social media page. And I said to my students and our staff, okay, we had a response, no one else respond, that's it. And the next day I walked into campus, we had threats of violence towards us, uh, people threatening to take my job. The women's family hired an attorney, contacted the chancellor's office. Apparently first amendment doesn't apply to me, but only to them. They were the ones that posted the images and they came at me. They would never call me Dr. Proudfit. It was just really nasty. And so we had to call the local the campus police and make sure that our students and our, and our staff were protected because we had the audacity to say, this is inappropriate, don't do this, come get educated. And their response was to attack us further. And so I said to, to everybody, let's leave all these comments up uh, until Friday. And then at Friday at four o'clock, we're going to go ahead and take them down, but we're going to screenshot everything because we're going to write about this because we don't believe in getting even. We believe in getting justice. And that's what I teach my students. And so um, come Friday, I was then asked to meet with the university, um, with my boss, um, with a lawyer. Um, and that, like I said, those women had hired an attorney, contacted the chancellor's office, and they had no, they had no option but to nice the campus, but to nicely request if I would go ahead and remove off of our social media the pictures of these women. I said, well, I didn't put it up. They did. I'm just responding to it. But remember, we had already decided to take it down. So we, we, you know, we acquiesced and said, sure. They've hijacked our social media for an, you know enough time, but it just really, um, it was a rude awakening to all of us. And what really hurt and what hurt my students is that nobody chimed in on our behalf. No other departments, no other um, faculty of color or associations. And just a few months earlier, there had been a um, Chola themed party. 
where students dressed up like cholas, like Mexican American, Chicano, right, with that whole like a stereotype. And there was all of this outrage. And I even referenced that as standing in solidarity and that this kind of behavior has to stop. So it's really hurtful to all of us to find that we were standing alone. And so out of that, I met with my students. I then pulled all of the other diverse students, the Black Student Association, the Latino Student Association, the Asian Student Association. I even went reached out to the Arab American students who didn't have an association and I said let's do a campaign. And so what we did was a campaign a poster campaign called there's more to me than what you see behind the stereotype there's history. And what we did is we created these beautiful posters that um, and, and so they had a real live um, student from one of those racial groups and behind them was a historical icon. Right. So for, we had an Asian American young man, and then we had a picture of um, Senator Inouye. Right. So, so it was an opportunity for people to learn about them. And what was really interesting is this: the university pulled the Arab American ones because they said that um, we didn't have Jewish ones. And I said, we're talking about Arab American. We're not talking about religion. So to like even educate further cultural appropriation. So we did this wonderful cultural appropriation campaign that's being used in Germany and Brazil and I made it free and open so anyone can download these posters at any time and use them. But then I decided to write a whole book on cultural appropriation and the front cover of the book is was a student at that time who worked on that campaign um, and, and his name is Michael Murphy. He's a young student from Pachanga, was a young student from Pachanga. He's now a man working in his professional career, but he's the cover of the book and he, he it was a picture of him and sitting bull standing beside behind him so what we we turned a really yucky racial incident into an international campaign and now it's my forthcoming book that looks at all things cultural appropriation hey that's a great segue because i have a question that's thank you so much for sharing that what an amazing thing to overcome but also to teach so as marianne said failure always teaches us so Marianne, real quick, I want to ask you, you know, as Jolie was talking about, many folks have a common misconception that our Native culture or our Native ways no longer exist or have become extinct. So we know that not to be true. So just can you give me one example or an example of a native tradition that the young people in your community still have uh, a strong connection to, as well as maybe the next generation and how they contributed to your culture uh, or your tribe's culture in some way and how they're carrying it on? Yes, I think, I think the strongest, the most resilient, the longest lasting ceremonies we have are our death ceremonies. And all of our children from the time they're small go through these. They start at noon one day and end at noon the next day. So it's a, it's a long uh, process uh, that is meant to be a sacrifice of time and, and um, teach the children that if when you go through these ceremonies, it's, it's a way to um, take your grief, take your feelings and um, believe that this you send this person on the on their way to their home beyond the stars in the right way and then you don't keep them here forever you don't keep on mourning if you keep on mourning then you keep them here and keep them from going on where they need to get to so all of our young people are exposed to that and all of them um, learn that at a young age uh, even though the the uh, proper protocol is that children are seen and not heard. They're not allowed to run, play, laugh, cry. Uh, we learned that very early, uh, very harshly dealt with if you do any of that. So yeah, I think that would be the strongest and the oldest and the most meaningful to the, to the tribe and to the people and to the, to the history. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, w I grew up knowing about whatever I, whatever land, uh, whatever river, whatever, you know, grouse, whatever I, I learned about it and forever, it's always going to be in me, no matter what I'm always going to right. that. That's right. Yeah. So Nicole, I know, uh, Marianne said you're, you're the best person to ask this, but I did want to talk 
uh, it, you know, we're, we're, we're getting close on the hour at the end of the hour, but I did want to, I wanted to see if you could tell us a little bit about the 1978 Indian Child Welf Welfare Act and how, well, obviously we know some of it, how it impacted the, the Native community, but can you give us a, a little insight on that and the Child Welf Welf Welfare Act of 1978? Sure. Um, the Indian Child Welfare Act in 1978 was the result of um, reports that were really demonstrating that Native children were being adopted outside of their home, especially by state welfare systems at academic proportions, um, especially in states like Utah and, um, and Montana and and other places where there was really a lack of understanding of native culture and parenting. And a lot of times social workers and state practitioners would look at native children and see and, and cite neglect as a reason for removal. Um, really discounting the fact that culturally our children are often raised by extended family members, uh, children who are designated um, or identified as, um, as doctors, as medicine people are mentored throughout their lifetime. Um, obviously economic conditions on reservations, especially at that time um, were, were um, hard and there's not a lot of jobs on reservations at that time until we have you know, economic development now where parents had to go off reservation for extended amount of time um, and not wanting to take their children um, into inner cities. So there are lots of different reasons, but it did not amount to neglect. And so we have you know, thousands of children now who are trying to retrace their biological parents and uh, their connections to their tribes um, because culture is really important and to be raised without that culture and knowing your community and your identity um, can be quite devastating for people as they as they grow up and and um, and don't know that so uh, fortunately, a, a lot of children have been able to reconnect to their reservations, but currently, you know, the Indian Child Welfare Act is in jeopardy. It's been under legal assault, and there is a movement to really try to uh, get rid of the Indian Child Welfare Act, um, citing racism, uh, citing um, the lack that, you know, the the opposition saying that um, it's not no longer needed. And it's really critical that we preserve the Indian Child Welfare Act because that act facilitates that Native children are, um, are able to be placed in other family or tribal homes, which keeps them connected to their cultures and their communities. You know, often as tribal leaders, we say our future is our children. Um, well, every, they've attempted to take everything from us, whether it was boarding schools or through uh, the social um, welfare system, they've removed our children um, at alarming rates and um, our children need to stay close to home and close to our people and within their ancestral territory so that they can grow up as whole human beings. Yeah, so that's absolutely awesome that you mentioned that because I did want to I did want to get some examples. Okay, I want to I want to kind of steward the truth, right, and how to teach about Na Native Americans in ethnic studies. So, Jolie, can you give me two examples? If if we were to tell everybody here and they were to take it back, right, give me couple examples on how we can steward the truth in how to teach about Native American and ethnic studies. And hopefully everybody here that's listening, maybe they can take that back. Just one or two examples that you, that you might find important. Well, I think it's really important to listen and learn from the people. FUBU, for us, by us, right? It's not just a hip hop clothing line. It's a really good, um, 
uh, way to think about for us by us. I mean, there are so many California Indian scholars, for example, just you know, to, to center California Indians, because after all, we're in California. And so it, it behooves people to not just give land acknowledgments, but to learn about the people of the land who they're residing on and to learn from the people themselves. So there's you know, we have lots of, of good books and resources. Um, you can find good materials on the California Indian Museum and Cultural Center website, on the California Indian Culture and Sovereignty Center. And for educators out there, we have a website called California Indian Education for All that has teacher training and resources. So learning from the people and participating at events, you know, social and cultural events. Morongo does a beautiful powwow. They have fiesta days. They have a museum. Um, Maki on their tribal lands. So most tribal communities offer some type of opportunity to, to learn from the land and the people themselves. So anytime we can learn um, um, our knowledges and our instructions um, about the people from the people, we should. And, and because of you know the media, there's all kinds of ways, but but you know, pick up books by native people, watch videos, vision maker media, which is I happen to be the chair of the board of Vision Maker Media, but these are PBS videos. So pretty much any video that airs on PBS that's about Native America, we funded and supported it. And right now, Native American Heritage Month, if you watch PBS tonight, I know there's a Native American documentary. That's an easy cheat sheet way to learn about Native peoples is to watch uh, media made by us. So making sure it's for us by us. Thank you, for us by us, got it. And then, um, so, so with that, I, I just, I did want to talk a little bit about, you know, the stuff that we, we, we celebrate in our own lives. So Marianne or Nicole, um, food has been a huge part of my upbringing as a native woman because of the way we were taught to hunt as children and the way we were taught, um, my, my uncle's mother was a medicine woman. So we were taught a lot of how to learn um, the, the food that was around us coming from the land. So um, Nicole or Marianne, give us uh, what meals did your grandmother or your aunties make for you? They gave you pride in your native meal and your cooking. Or uh, if I could go first, Nikki, um, you know, understanding how we lived, we, uh, my, my grandparents had, um, had their own garden. They had, uh, they had apricot orchards, they had almond orchards, they had grape vineyards. But in addition to that, they had their own personal garden where they grew their own food. And my grandfather hunted for rabbit, deer, quail, or the meat. And so that was how we ate. It was um, uh, fry bread, tortillas. I mean, those are wonderful smells that bring back my childhood. Uh, you know, it's been a long time since I've had a good rabbit stew. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we grew up that way. <clears throat> and so, you know, those are just things that were passed on and things that we ate as a matter of course, excuse me. I love me some quail, favorite. Yeah, quail, <laughs> also some duck, you know, there were um, call them mud ducks up in the canyon <laughs> and uh, just everything, you know, my aunt would always say, people come here and they see a desert, but I see a grocery store. <laughs> and uh, a lot of things that that people wouldn't imagine that that we ate or used otherwise, you know, she would take us on walks at night and tell us what what was used for what and how to prepare it. Don't just take it off the ground and like milkweed you used in your eyes, but don't just take it off the ground and put it in your eyes. You have to boil it and prepare it. I know that because I did that. <laughs> <laughs> So that I know, milkweed in the eyes. <laughs> yep, don't try it, anybody. Don't try it. <laughs> don't try that at home. But those, those were the traditional meals. Um, I just ran across a poem that my cousin wrote today about great lady, grand lady, sitting at your wood stove, making your tortillas all by hand. And she was talking about my grandmother um, and how she all fed us and how we all waited. Now we all stood around the wood stove and how we all waited for that first one to come off the hot stove and butter and, and eat. And, you know, those are things that we still do today. But uh, yeah, she wrote that down in a poem and I just happened to read that today. Great lady, grand lady. Beautiful. Yeah. Nicole, what about you? Very similar. Um, 
my grandmother, no matter what time of day you came into her home, she always had a table full of plenty of selections of food, everything from beans to tortillas to um, seaweed to abalone. Um, we were very fortunate and, you know, we've been very distanced from our traditional food of not really having the access to the resources. Our abalones are on a five year ban because of climate change and they're starving in the ocean. Um, the privatization of land, we're surrounded by uh, great vineyards, um, you know, that impact our oak savannas. Um, and now more recently with the wildfires that happened during our harvest season, it really creates challenges. Um, and so, you know, it's land privatization access, but also the transmission of that intergenerational knowledge of knowing how to harvest, process, store, and cook our traditional foods is something that we've been really working on at the museum and our travel youth ambassadors are very passionate about. Uh, so passionate, in fact, that they came up with an idea a few years ago um, about creating an acorn protein bar. And um, I thought, well, yeah, definitely, let's do that. Um, and it was it was quite a challenge. Um, not so much the recipe. We worked with this wonderful chef, uh, Chef Crystal Wapapa, who just opened a um, restaurant in the East Bay. Um, she is Kickapoo, but has Pomo children and was very vested in, in creating a, a traditional food in a modern context. And so uh, we came up with Acorn Bites. You can go to acornbites.com and um, purchase their acorn protein bars. Um, so we've really been doing a lot of research around our traditional foods and working with food dehydrators and freeze dryers and different methods so that we can really integrate them more into our daily lives. They shouldn't just be something that we have once in a while and creating tools and resources so that if we can't gather and access our traditional foods, knowing what those nutritional equivalents are when we go in the grocery store. You know, acorn is a a superior protein. It nourishes our body, but it's part of our ancestral landscape. It's part of our DNA. We need that resource to be healthy and sustained. And so um, another plug for our, our Tribal Youth Ambassadors is if you go on our museum website, they just came out with a food sovereignty toolkit. Um, it has resolutions that your tribe can pass to prioritize food sovereignty and nutrition and health. It has recipes, it has traditional tea guides, it has a grocery shopping guide. Um, so please visit that uh, site and, and use that resource because um, the kids worked really hard on it and it's amazing. Great, I just put that uh, in, the, in the chat too. So hopefully everybody can take a look at that. That's, that's amazing. I know it, you know, the acorn, process is not it's a it's a very unique process to get the nutrients out so I learned about it once I don't know it very well but that's I'm glad you brought that up um so also I wanted to ask Jolie sort of in this conversation about native sovereignty and land uh can you talk a little bit about why it's important to reconnect with the relatives who have been missing from our ceremonies and from our lives for far too long. Um, I know for me, I, I took a long time to realize the pride that I should have in the relatives that taught me. So um, just give us, you know, give us a little conversation about why that's really important to reconnect with our relatives. But before I do that, I want to talk about food too. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Please, yeah. Well, I have to it's give I have to give props to Mary Ann's daughter Cindy because she is the world's greatest tortilla maker. Oh yeah. You oh. know, even ask my husband, you know, unfortunately her mama taught her well. Yes. We, <laughs> you know, and and you know, going back to to ceremony and tradition, you know, the unfortunately sometimes the only time we eat some of these foods are at um, funerals, right, that bring us together, um, but it's still a part of who we are and a part of tradition. So with every um, 
uh, you know, episode of change comes this good opportunity of learning. So there's this this new way of opportunity. And as a as a college teacher, I I, I remember fry bread sales. Those were important for us to have speakers and to do things. But I made a conscientious choice for for my students to not sell fry bread. Um, could we have it and make it every once in a while? Absolutely. But truly, it's our slave food. It was what we had to do with our commodities. And I enjoy a good piece of fry bread like everybody else. But I, I didn't feel like we should, as our students, sell that to the public like that, like we own that, you know, because um, we wanted to take back our culture and our identity. And so we worked with our, lo our local um, tribal practitioners of learning how to harvest Indian lettuce and learning how to make things with our uh, acorn flour. And so our students started making chia cookies and chia lemonade and, you know, um, inviting mesquite cakes. mesquite cakes and inviting the campus community to share that. And it's become a very much a delicacy and as people become more and more foodies and more about nutrition, um, it's a, it's an exciting time, right? Because we all know about fry bread and who doesn't love a fry bread? But it's really about uh, of humbling ourselves and going back to your question of, of knowing, being able to accept what we don't know and inviting those who can teach us into learning and to learning together. You know, I, I once um, worked for a tribe which would remain nameless, but they, um, they, most of the tribal membership didn't realize they owned an organic farm. And I had brought Winona LeDuc out um, to talk to our college and the chef from that tribe's community facility came and harvested the food at their organic farm and made all of this wonderful traditional, you know, pre-contact food. And the community wasn't even benefiting from what they had owned. So a lot of it is just like really taking the time to relearn because we don't come out of the womb with this knowledge. It has to be taught from us. And a lot of these knowledges were taken away, just like our languages were taken away. And so we really need to depend on many of the same institutions that had a hand in taking this knowledge with putting it back. I think every public institution of, of education from preschool to college should be reteaching the land of the people of that place for free to anyone and everyone who wants to learn it. I think these places should be reteaching us how to use the food of this land Right, to, so we can nourish our bodies. Because when you look at what we ate pre contact, we wouldn't have diabetes if we mm. were eating the way our ancestors did. Well, so, we worked a lot harder too physical labor, a lot more physical movement. A lot more physical movement, but just knowing what to eat and how to um, nourish ourselves, our body, our spirit is reconnecting with the land. And so that's going to take some time, but that's also going to take some effort. And there's a fun process in doing that because we're reconnecting by learning the songs. You know, I learned from some of our younger people who have the good fortune of learning as younger people now that, you know, we have availability of schools and language programs. Now we have a whole set of children that get to learn you know, their language from preschool on up that weren't available to us. So sometimes I call some of my younger students and I'm like, okay, how do you say this? And how do you phrase this? And, you know, it's okay. It's, it's, we're, we're always learning because if we're learning, that means we're still alive. Right. That's right. And, and, and so I think it's, it's a, it's a privilege to, to get to be here, to share knowledge, to accept knowledge and, and to um, pre uh, provide a space, a safe space for folks who are willing to learn. So I applaud all of the language teachers, all of the language learners, all of the people who are trying to learn their traditional medicine and food ways. I just think we need more and more and more of that. Thank you so much. Wow, this was a very deep, because that's how we do, <laughs> deep uh, conversation. And I am so honored to be here with you women. And thank you so much for allowing me to moderate this and to share about my own life uh, and my own culture growing up. So I just wanna say thank you to all of you. Um, thank you, Emma. You're welcome. And then if you have any last minute remarks, um, but we're coming to the end of the hour, just wanna make sure I, I also thank assembly member James Ramos for opening the opening video remarks and for sharing uh, the song with us. Um, and then, of course, all of you, Marianne, Dr. Jolie Proudfit, Nicole Lim, thank you all so much for sharing this evening with us. Thank you. I think it's a, she was talking before you got on, Jolie, about how we'll start planning earlier next year 
or something more significant, different, but, uh, you know, so come up with some good creative ideas. But, you know, yeah. I, I really love this format because sometimes we just don't have the time to share our knowledge and to talk to you about what's going on. I really would like to hold a forum um, like the Black Caucus has been doing about how important it is to serve our American Indian students in public education because we're really missing the mark and we really need to dedicate some time to to addressing that. So I'd love to to work with all of you on on that because it's going to take all hands on deck. Do you know, we have 307,000 K through 12 teachers in California. California, that means 307,000 teachers we have to retrain. We have to retrain for professional development. So folks, we got to exactly. work that out for us. But I also want to make a plug because it's Native American Heritage Month. So there's lots of activities going on. And tomorrow is 10 years since we moved into the California Indian Culture and Sovereignty Center. So we're having a little reception tomorrow. And many of the people who are on this call were there. And Nikki, your dad was there 10 years ago. I was Joe just, Myers was there. Joe right. Myers was there. Robert Freeman was there. Marshall McKay was there. And those oh. are Oh people who are no longer with us and so we're going to memorialize them tomorrow and and share those images and share some good stories and so if you're anywhere near san marcos southern california come on by and then we're going to follow that up with the play the thanksgiving play um which is a very fun play written by larissa fast horse so you know come on and and sign up um, at the california culture and sovereignty center for our newsletter for events and learning opportunities so i that's just a way to kind of share Share in knowledge and I thank you Emma and India and and the Anthony team, Anthony for all your work and effort and together we are like the most discombobulated busy people I went from <laughs> another meeting to this meeting but we make it happen and I and I thank you everyone for your patience and I look forward to to sharing um somebody um, just mentioned that in the chat I just saw her on another zoom <laughs> I did also want to mention that Andrew Masil meant to be here, but he was having some te technical uh, difficulties, but he, uh, I wanted to give a shout out to Andrew as, as well, okay. uh, just because, you know, he had some- It's Andy's turn. Usually it's my turn. <laughs> <laughs> it's Andy's turn, yeah, for the yeah. technical difficulties. Um, Thank you so, so much, India. Yeah. And then I'm going to give a plug. So I want to know if all of you will consider making a contribution to the California Democratic Party Future Leaders Internship Program. So we are now we now have a wonderful um, put forth by, you know, the officers of the party and Yvette Martinez, uh, our executive director. We now have a paid internship program. And of course, oh. the delegates as well. Um, so we're going to put it in the chat. So if you do have a uh, couple, uh, you know, some change in your pocket, uh, we would love for you to donate to that cause for building, you know, future leaders uh, through our internship program here at the California Democratic Party. Okay. So thank you all. And you all have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. You too.